Introducing Rabbi Joel Zaff at 10.03 on a Wednesday morning as we zip along with Zoom with your father, Nishkolo. And I think it's the concluding. Incorrect. The conclusion Correct. of the series related to Ben Ezra, Madan Torah, and related topics. Rabbi Zaff will elucidate. Hi, everybody. So uh, as Bruce just said, uh, hopefully this will be our last session on this specific topic. And we'll do a quick review because we didn't meet last week. Uh, we started off this topic by taking a look at the most basic assumption of Torah Judaism, and that is the Torah, that the Torah is a product of divine revelation. As the Rambam stated, <clears throat> that one of the articles of faith is that we are to believe that the Torah that we have in our hands is the same Torah that was given to Moshe, every word from in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth until the last few words of the Torah says, Lene Ko Yisrael, in front of the eyes of all of Israel, that every word was revealed to Moshe and has been handed down flawlessly from generation to generation into our hands. Now, we also pointed out that this idea has to be understood on a little bit of a sophisticated level that though people like to use the expression Torah mi Sinai, the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai, that's not exactly true. That even according to the way the Talmud understands this idea, that there were successive revelations that took place in the period in the wilderness. And that when those successive revelations took place, so <clears throat> Moshe either wrote them down as they took place, and at the end of the 40 years, took all of these segments and sewed them together, and then you have the Torah, or he memorized them as they were revealed one by one throughout the years in the wilderness. And then at the end of the 40 years before he died, then he wrote them all down. Okay, so that's one very important point to keep in mind. The other important point to keep in mind is that the Talmud itself has one opinion which suggests that at least the last eight verses, the last eight verses which describe the death of Moshe, perhaps that wasn't written by Moshe, but that was information that was revealed subsequent to Moshe's death uh, after Moshe died to Yehoshua, and that Yehoshua wrote those down. Okay, so the idea has a certain uh, amount of nuance to it, but fundamentally, the Torah as we have it is the Torah given to Moshe, with the possible exception of or only according to one opinion of the last ape suki. Fine, all is good. The only problem is the Ibn Ezra. So the Ibn Ezra, as we pointed out, is probably the most difficult uh, commentator to understand uh, among the famous medieval commentators, even though he's considered to be in the top three, Rashi, Ramban, and Ibn Ezra, yet the Ibn Ezra is often not studied at all because he's so cryptic, uh, difficult to understand. And that's why we have at least 73 super commentaries written on the commentary of the Ibn Ezra, trying to explain the Ibn Ezra. Well, the Ibn Ezra makes a rather cryptic statement. In the beginning of his commentary on the book of Devarim, De Deuteronomy, he quotes the first few words, which tell the location and time of the speeches that Moshe is about to give, that most of the book of Devarim are composed of, is composed of these series of speeches given by Moshe. And concerning the spatial location and the time location, the Ibn Ezra says that if you want to understand this particular passage, so, well, if you'll understand the secret of the 12, and then he lists five other verses in the Torah, and if you'll understand this verse and that verse and this verse and that verse and this verse, then you will know the truth. That's all he says. So if you'll understand the secret of the 12, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, takir et demet, you'll understand the truth. Now, nobody knows 100% what he means, but it certainly is provocative. And we pointed out that one of the most fundamental and the most helpful super commentaries on the Ibn Ezra, that commentary is called Safnat Paneach, which is based upon the name given by Yosef. We just saw that recently in our weekly Torah reading. 
uh, that commentary, which comes from not long after the Ibn Ezra's life himself, it's also medieval, also from Spain, that super commentary suggests that when the Ibn Ezra says the secret of the 12, he's referring to the 12 last verses of the Torah, which happens to be the last chapter of the Torah. That in addition to the last eight verses, which one opinion in the Talmud suggests were uh, revealed to Yehoshua, the Ibn Ezra is saying, why not just say the whole chapter? Because the whole chapter is describing in the third person, Moshe going up to the mountain, seeing all of Eretz Israel, and then dying. And the Ibn Ezra there in that last chapter explicitly says from the very first verse of that last uh, chapter, which is 12 verses again. So he says this was revealed to Yehoshua. And he even says explicitly, Ibn Ezra, that when the verse says that nobody knows the place of the burial of Moshe until this very day, right, when it says until this very day implies some kind of longer time frame of distance till this very day it implies that when Moshe was buried it was a long time ago he says that was real to Yoshua maybe at the end of his Yoshua's life so we're talking about a, a longer time uh, period so the stuff not today says well based upon the fact that the Ibn are explicitly in the last chapter of Dvarim says those last 12 verses uh, come from Yoshua so that's the secret of the 12 right that the 12 verses were all uh, revealed to Yoshua not to Moshe so then the Safna Pideach says, well, that must be the secret behind all of those other verses. There's a whole series of verses, right, six in total, which are, we'll use an academic term, post-Mosaic additions to the Torah. Fine. Now, we pointed out that other medieval biblical commentators do not like this approach. We saw the Rabbeinu Bachaye or Rabbeinu Bachya, right, people pronounce it different ways. Uh, who's one of the also major medieval commentators, quotes the Ibn Ezra. He calls him a chacham, a sage, so he's respectful. But he says in, in this respect that to say that the entire chapter, uh, the last chapter of Devarim is post-Mosaic, was revealed to Yoshua, even at the end of Yoshua's life, that's incorrect, he says. And he says that uh, all of the problematics with these different verses which you read them in a natural manner, seem to suggest that they were written after the death of Moshe, like descriptions of his own death, Moshe's death. Or for instance, when the Torah describes Abraham's entrance to the land of Israel, and the verse says, the Kanani Azbaretz, that the Canaanite was then in the land, that's another one of the six, uh, implies that, well, that verse could not have been written in Moshe's, lifetime, because in Moshe's lifetime, the Canaanite was still in the land. But it says the Canaanite was then in the land applies then, but not now. That's the simplest reading of that verse. So how could Moshe have written that verse? It, it must be coming from a, a later time when the Canaanite was no longer in the land. But when was that? <laughs> That's a lot later, right? So uh, the Rebbe Bakri says, what's the big deal? Moshe is not recording his own experiences he's recording information which is revealed to him by god so the fact that there are verses which describe things that uh, are would be best understood as if they're coming from a future perspective the fact that moshe wrote those down it should not be understood as being problematic because he's just taking dictation as it were from god and god is eternal he can write anything from any time perspective that he wants to. And so this is the way that uh, the vast majority of traditional commentators understand these problematic verses. They're a product of divine revelation. And so therefore, uh, we should not uh, look at them as if it's a travelogue written by Moshe. And how could that particular verse have been written by Moshe as a travelogue when it's re referring to something that he couldn't possibly have known about? Okay. Now, we pointed out that if we go forward in Jewish history and see how uh, this rather provocative approach of the Ibn Ezra, again, the Ibn Ezra himself doesn't explicitly say that those six verses are post mosaic. He only says that explicitly with reference to the last chapter of the book of Devarim. It's the Safna Paneach and other commentators who say that's what the Ibn Ezra must have meant, referring to the other verses that he 
uh, refers to, the Ibedez refers to in the beginning of the book of Devarim. Uh, but in any case, uh, we go forward in Jewish history and we get to Spinoza. So Spinoza, who, uh, according to our good friend Arthur, failed to pay his synagogue dues and got into a lot of trouble for that. In addition to the high crime of not paying his synagogue dues, he happened to also have been a heretic. <laughs> and that is, <laughs> he quotes the Ibn Ezra, and he says the Ibn Ezra was this great biblical commentator. And Ibn Ezra already alludes to, this is Spinoza saying it, Ibn Ezra is already alluding to what Spinoza himself says, and that is that the Torah as we have it is not the Torah of Moshe. He goes so far as to say that there was a Torah of Moshe, but it was a very thin, small book. How does Spinoza know this? So he quotes the Ibn Ezra. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> His quote of Ibn Ezra is really not what the Ibn Ezra says. Spinoza says the Ibn Ezra refers to the secret of the 12. Well, we pointed out the secret of the 12 is probably a reference to the 12 last verses of the Torah. However, Spinoza says that's not what the Ibn Ezra meant. The Ibn Ezra meant that if you combine certain passages in the book of Devarim and in the book of Yoshua, and put them together based upon a midrashic understanding. It's a little complicated. It seems that when Yehoshua entered the land of Israel, they set up 12 stones, and upon those 12 stones, they recorded the entire Torah. This is how Spinoza understands uh, what he regards as a historical fact. Now, Spinoza says the following, and he attributes this to Ibn Ezra. How could Yoshua have written the entire Torah as we have it on 12 stones. It won't fit. And they didn't have micrography back then, you know, you know, or laser printing in very small print. There's no way you could write the entire Torah on 12 stones. That Torah of Moshe, which was written on 12 stones, was the original Torah of Moshe, which was a small book. Where'd the Torah come from? That we have. That is accumulated material that crept into the original Torah of Moshe over many, many years, and only in the time of Ezra. We're talking about the beginning of the Second Temple period after the Babylonian exile. Only then do we have the what we call the Torah. And according to Spinoza's reading of the Ibn Ezra, it would be incorrect to call our Torah, Torah Moshe, the Torah of Moshe. It's not the Torah of Moshe. Torah of Moshe is lost. It was some small book. We don't have it anymore. The Torah as we have it is a, a accumulation of documents that some of it perhaps coming from the time of Moshe, but uh, accumulating over time until you get to the time of Ezra and it's all canonized and put together. Spinoza reads this into the Ibn Ezra. Now the Ibn Ezra doesn't say this, right? Spinoza attributes it to the Ibn Ezra. The only thing the Ibn Ezra says explicitly, as we've said before, uh, is that the 12 last verses in the Torah come from the time of Yahushua. More than that, he doesn't say explicitly. <clears throat> Furthermore, what's even more perplexing is that uh, it, regarding the secret of the 12, which this Spinoza says is a reference to the 12 stones, so that's a rather perplexing understanding of the Ibn Ezra because it, Ibn Ezra is probably referring to the last 12 verses, but more than that. The Ibn Ezra does explicitly discuss what was written on those 12 stones. He explicitly addresses that. And he says, it's not the Torah. What was written on the 12 stones, he quotes Rav Sajigon, was a selection of some of the mitzvot of the Torah. That's it. That's why you could have things that are written on the 12 stones. But Ibn Ezra himself says, that's not, the Torah was not written on 12 stones. It was a selection of mitzvot based on the interpretation of Rosa Diego. So uh, Spinoza is taking a lot of literary license in attributing to the Ibn Ezra uh, a much more uh, radical and drastic understanding of how the Torah as we have it came into being. The Ibn Ezra doesn't say what Spinoza says he says. He says in the direction that Spinoza says, but Spinoza took that much further. And we saw Rabbi Shmuel David Lutzato, 
who takes the uh, Spinoza to task on this, and he has very harsh words to say about the Ibn Ezra for falsifying, or to, for, to uh, Spinoza for falsifying what the Ibn Ezra uh, actually said. Now, it's important to bear in mind that in modern contemporary biblical critic circles, they sort of do what Spinoza did, and that is they see the Ibn Ezra as being the great pioneer of breaking out of this traditional assumption that the Torah was revealed to Moshe, every word of it. Right? The Ibn Ezra was sort of the pioneer breaking out of that. They don't, modern biblical critics don't falsify what the Ibn Ezra said, but they certainly regard him as the one who sort of broke the, through the barrier of the traditionalist assumption and paved the way to a, uh, this sort of notion of historical development of the text of the Torah uh, as we have it. So the Ibn Ezra is definitely viewed as a pioneer uh, and kind of a, a, a heroic figure. In this so, so, so here's a question, Rav, uh, Rav Zef. If, was he never lambasted for opening the door to people like uh, Spinoza? Now, who's he? Ibn Ezra. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when you look, when you look in, in Shmuel David Lutzato, Shadal, he does that uh, explicitly. Uh, he, and though he's not 100% um, clear, he seems to allude to uh, 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 a dissatisfaction with Ibn Ezra. In other words, the Ibn Ezra took liberties uh, because he went beyond just saying the last eight verses. He says explicitly last 12 and perhaps even means, and Shadal understands him to mean that all of the six verses are post mosaic. He, he attributes that to the Ibn Ezra, right? So he takes a, uh, uh, that view that it, that indeed, the Ibn Ezra held that there are other post mosaic editions, six of them. Uh, but he says, look what happened. This is this is in, in normal, in sort of Talmudic terminology, this is parade together, which means to break through the fence, right? Or what we call in English, slippery slope, right? Mm -hmm. Once you say there are six post mosaic editions, which the Ibn Ezra perhaps did say that, it's hard to know 100%, but he seems to say that. So that's a slippery slope. From there, you get to Spinoza. And from Spinoza, you get to the 19th century uh, Wellhausen and the other uh, pioneers of the documentary hypothesis, et cetera. So uh, Ibn Ezra was criticized by uh, Shadal and, and others for this. But yes, then, would, then, then wouldn't we expect, you know, at, at least by the standards of the world we're living in, that the Haredim would have... Uh put him in Kherem, that he wouldn't appear in Mikraot to go a lot throughout the centuries and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it, it is interesting. Uh, and I, I agree with you that it is surprising that he hasn't been like cut out of Mikraot. But I would say the following, uh, and we explored this just a little bit in our last session. There have been attempts at uh, uh, conservatizing, I'm making up a new English word there, with a small c, conservatizing the Ibn Ezra that uh, something in this direction. Look, the Ibn Ezra only explicitly says the last 12 verses. With regard to the other verses, he doesn't explain what unifies them. What's the common denominator? He just says it's a, a secret, right? So we don't know what he means. Maybe he means, and there are super commentaries like the Makoka Ke Yehuda, which is a popular a uh, hundred years ago, super commentary written on Ibn Ezra by someone named uh, uh, Krinsky, Rabbi Krinsky, so uh, in Russia. So he suggests the only thing that Ibn Ezra really meant was that uh, Yehoshua uh, uh, wrote, uh, I'm sorry, that, that Moshe wrote these verses by divine inspiration, uh, but not having witnessed them. Now, I think it's an untenable interpretation of Ibn Ezra, but there are commentators who suggest that he's not actually saying anything radical. Uh, it should also be pointed out when Ibn Ezra uses the word, I have a secret for you, sowed. I did a little search. Ibn Ezra uses the word sowed, secret. He's a secret for us over 200 times in his commentary. Sowed doesn't mean necessarily Ibn Ezra like, oh, I have something heretical to say, but I'm, you know, I'm afraid to say it explicitly. It just means uh, a, a, a sophisticated interpretation of something. So there are super commentaries who try to sort of scale down the radicalness of Ibn Ezra. Uh, 
Um, so I don't really have an answer for you. Why wasn't he taken out? I just have a, it, it just could be like, you know, if, if, you know, if you've been around for 800 years, it's hard to cut you out of the microcodile oak. Luckily, the Benezra is so hard to understand. He's printed there, but no one learns him. <laughs> so that's probably the real reason. Like, who learns the Benezra anyway? <laughs> okay, yeah. Now, uh, so what I want to do uh, today is explore how Ruff Cook relates to this whole issue. Bear in mind, Ruff Cook is <laughs> he's sort of a Haredi Jew on the one hand, and he's, but he's also very fresh and, 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 and radical uh, on the other hand, and kind of all, all integrated into one package. Uh, so I, I hope you uh, got the sources. They were, did Bruce send those out? Uh, looks like Bruce is taking a break there. I, I hope you got the sources. So this is going to be a uh, uh, not so easy because Rav Cook's language is, is difficult. I'm going to take a look at six passages from the writings of Rav Cook in which he addresses either explicitly the notion of post-Mosaic additions to the Torah, or he's addressing the general notion of modern research methods, me, uh, methods to the exploration of Jewish tradition, right? Remember, Rav Cook dies in 1935. So 1865 to 1935. He knows all about what's been going on in contemporary uh, study, scientific study of Judaism. Uh, this was something which had become very popular in the 19th century. There's a good German word for this, Wiesenschaft des Judentums, the scientific study of Judaism. This is what gave birth ultimately to reforming conservative Judaism, ways of reinterpreting the text of Jewish tradition uh, in a historical context and using contemporary uh, methodology. So Ralph Cook knows all about that. And Ralph Cook is trying to address a generation which is alienated from traditional Judaism. And part of their alienation uh, is a function of this uh, new way of looking at Jewish tradition through the lenses of academic scholarship, which challenges traditional dogma, traditional assumptions. Everybody ready? Let's dig in. So let's take a look at the first source here. Rav Cook says the following. Anachnu ba'im lidei kol tekumotenu ayidei hakesher hagamor shalagu v'nishama v'aguda achat. Cook says the following. This renewal, the renaissance of the Jewish people, we are approaching with a fresh perspective. I'm sort of paraphrasing here which sees the, the body and the soul as being united. This is a central theme in Rav Cook's thinking. Rav Cook claims that the Jewish people have experienced a kind of spiritual sickness in exile in which we become alienated from the body. Because since we didn't have our own country, we became a sort of soul a nation that exists only on the spiritual level because we don't have a way of expressing ourselves as a nation on a physical level. We don't have a country. We don't have an army. We don't have a political system. We don't have an economic system. We're just some kind of disembodied nation. So the return to Zion represents the Jewish return to bodiliness, to physicality. So the notion of goof and the Shema, body and soul coming together, is at the very core of Jewish Renaissance. And then he goes on. The whole Perud Haba Lachutz Benehem. Any, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> anything which tries to divide between body and soul. This weakens the might of the Jewish people. 
הרבה סובלנו ועדיין אנו סובלים מאלה אשר ניתקו את התורה שבכתב מאור של תורה שבעל פה. We have suffered much. Now here we're getting, you know, what does this have to do with biblical criticism? You're going to see. He says, we have suffered much from those who have attempted to disconnect the written Torah from the light of the oral Torah. Bill Cook says a fascinating thing. This notion of separation of body and soul applies to Torah. How so? Metaphorically, you could view the written Torah as the body. That's the body of Torah. What's the soul of Torah? The oral Torah. That's the oral traditions. That informs the meaning of the written Torah. Just like the soul should inform the way our body behaves. And disconnecting the written Torah from the oral Torah is that old disease that we've experienced for 2,000 years of disconnecting the physical from the spiritual. Kol shitot hatayalaminehen. All subversive ideologies throughout Jewish history, he claims, were based upon the disconnect of the Torah from the oral traditions. And he names them. Hakutim, the Samaritans. Hatstukim, the Sadducees. Hakaraim, the Kairites. They all were disconnecting the body and the soul. The written Torah from the oral Torah. And anybody who misinterprets the Torah, whatever their sect is called, call Ela Hamidu at Pshat Vatsab Muforad. Now get this now. Now we're gonna get into biblical criticism. Their sin is to establish the pshat of the Torah, the simple meaning, in a state of being separate, matzav miforad, separate. To say that there's something, the natural meaning of the Torah as a text on its own, to even suggest that there's such a thing as looking at the written text on its own, that's the original sin of all subversive movements and is the original sin of biblical criticism, as you'll see in a second. The Ephes Hashpa'a, to suggest that the written text of the Torah exists on its own with no influence, Miyetu Darkea Torah, from other paths of Torah, Hamachsifim Lanoet Ora Bechomi which reveal the light of the Torah in all of its fullness, meaning remez, drash, sowed. Everybody here has heard of pardes. To say that the pay of pardes, pshat, the simple syntactical meaning of the Torah, can exist without all the other layers, interpretive layers of Rem is illusion, drosh, you know, interpretive, so mystical meaning, whatever those terms mean. So that robs the Torah of its authentic meaning. You can, there's no such thing as pshat on its own. Pardes is all one authentic entity. The separation of pshat, as if it can exist independently, from the other layers of meaning of Remez Drash Sod, he he shagarba gam kain at the Murad Shal Khorbana Gamor Shinus of Lima Yade Shulhe Ayat and Mikta Shash of Torah. It is this that has caused the rebellion of the total destruction of which we are suffering by those who are sending out their hand against the holiness of the Torah. Ela Mikhable Ker Mashem. Those who are destroying the vineyard of the Lord, it's very strong language, who are whoring after the vanities of the nations. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to explain what's he talking about here. 
Well, he's talking about biblical criticism, but what's his vanity of nations? Biblical criticism in the sense we think of it today, the documentary hypothesis, that arose in Germany in the 19th century among Protestant scholars who, and this is documented, you don't have to be <laughs> a conservative Jew with a small c to suggest this, that they are documented anti-Semites. Wellhausen and others who came with the documentary hypothesis were Jew haters. That's a fact. It's all, they themselves admit it. I mean, it's all in writing. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Solomon Schechter, Solomon Schechter was the uh, chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. <clears throat> Before that, he was in England <clears throat> at Cambridge, I believe. And then before that, he actually came from a Chabad family. Uh, you know, it was Eastern Europe with a traditional Chabad upbringing. So he's the sort of the godfather of the conservative movement in the United States. He has an essay in which he discusses uh, the documentary hypothesis, uh, which is often called higher criticism, higher criticism, higher biblical criticism. He calls it higher anti-Semitism. It's a phrase used by Solomon Schechter. So uh, that's when he says that Jews who are engaged in the documentary hypothesis and biblical criticism, they are uh, whoring after the vanity of the goyim. He says explicitly, particularly this monster, monstrous thing that has come from the learned Germans, Bellhausen, Hashkuim Basina, Basina, Israel, excuse me, who are who are submerged in hatred of Israel, Bechol Ofi Rucham with all of their spirit hoxlery, their cruel spirit, Asher Yanaku Otam, Asher Yanku Oto, Mishadei Gizam, that they suckle anti-Semitism from the breasts of their very race. I mean, this is amazing. Rav Cook is saying this, like German culture is suffused with anti-Semitism. They Germans get it from their mother's breasts, anti-Semitism. This is amazing. Uh, he writes this here. Hamar alanu ke'etet pertsufamiti, that now the Germans are showing us their true face, right? So I don't know exactly when this was written, but I, I, I'm guessing it was already written in the 20s and 30s when you had Nazi ideology already raising its head. And, uh, and from this glorious culture, we have the documentary hypothesis and uh, uh, Ralph Cook is lamenting how Jews are buying into this, which is coming from <clears throat> such a anti-Semitic uh, context and on a more ideological note, uh, suffers from uh, what he would, re would regard as the original sin of saying that there's such a thing as pshat in the Torah, right? pshat, which is disconnected from looking at it through the lens of Jewish tradition. And just to finish this off, the heim heim mechabrei asfarim amesuavim, they are the composers of these filthy texts, uh, which are uh, coming from this chutzpidic notion of habikort shel kitvei hakodesh, you know, criticism of Holy Scripture, higher criticism, right? It is in its totality a combination of evil and foolishness. And unfortunately, he says that uh, uh, their writings of these German anti Semites who invented the biblical criticism and, and uh, the documentary hypothesis have caused to whore after them some Jewish educators in our generation, much to our shame and distress. That's rough quote. Now, if we were to stop here, I would just say that, yeah, <laughs> that's a very conservative with a small c, Jewish approach, obviously ultra traditionalist approach towards the Torah and towards biblical scholarship, you know, coming out of this school of the uh, German higher criticism, uh, documentary hypothesis, et cetera. This is sort of what you would expect from a Haredi rabbi. Or even a centrist modern Orthodox rabbi, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. But put in your seatbelts. Ruff Cook is a very confusing writer for many reasons. We're going to see things from Ruff Cook now 
that uh, are hard to understand in, in light of the fact of what he just wrote. So I'm going to take a look at another essay that he wrote. It's actually in a personal letter. He's writing a letter to his family, to his parents. His father was also a great rabbi. And to his brother, who's also a rabbi, his brother named Shmuel. And this is particularly in the context of not talking about biblical criticism, but of the controversy surrounding Rav Cook's attitude towards Shemitah. So as you're probably aware of, Rav Cook came up with a very revolutionary approach that the kibbutzim, moshavim, in the land of Israel could, during the Shemitah year, instead of letting the land lie foul, they could still farm the land based upon selling the land temporarily to non-Jews. Although, although this wasn't his invention at all. No, it's true that there's precedent for that. You're 100% right. I don't want to get the whole, there are going to be many, many shiurim, because next year is Shemitah year on this. Uh, but Rav Kook, you know, since he was uh, in a position to be very influential, uh, so it wasn't or a theoretical thing. It, it, Rav Kook put it this way, Rav Kook is blamed for this approach, but you're 100% right. He was not the first to suggest it. His family was very distressed by the fact that this became such a source of dispute among the... Remember, Rav Cook is coming out of the Haredi world. His family is part of the Haredi world. And Rav Cook is being attacked by the great Torah scholars of the Haredi world and embroiled in controversy. And Rav Cook's family is, you know, what have you done? <laughs> Why are you embroiling yourself uh, in a position which is so out of the mainstream of uh, rabbinic thinking about this issue. And now he, he writes a long letter addressing it. And in this part of the letter, he's addressing specifically the distress uh, that his brother Shmuel was experiencing as a result of Rav Cook's controversial opinion about Shemitah and in general controversial opinions. Let's take a look. We'll go, try to go through this quickly. You know, my dear brother, your words are straight and with a spirit of justice and pure faith, they were said. Right? I understand your criticism of me, dear brother. But nevertheless, it's important that we expand our minds. And we should judge everybody favorably. Even if we need to use our imagination to judge people favorably. We should judge people favorably even if you have to make up some kind of scenario which somehow uh, doesn't cast our ideological opponents in such a negative light. We have to never forget that in every battle over ideas, after all of the agitation goes down, when people calm down, they will see that in both sides of ideological disputes, there's light and shadows, meaning there's no side which is all wrong or all right. Everything is a mixture of truth and falsehood. We have to see the truth in other views. This is true uh, in the way that Hashem guides history. There are going to be things that are uh, in every movement are correct and incorrect. And God has planned this, all of this ideological ferment, as a way to guide the world forward. While we should, in fact, battle on behalf of those things which are dear to us, in Jewish tradition, 
We should not be addicted to our emotions. Let me just tell you what he's saying here. Cook is saying, calm down. Whenever we approach something which seems out of line with tradition, do not become overly reactive and re and rejectionist, right? The emotional response would be to say, this is not in accordance with my viewpoints. This is not in accordance with Jewish tradition. And therefore it's invalid and wrong and heresy. No. We have to calm down and look carefully at the idea of the opposition. Okay. Um, so now what does he mean by this? You'll see in the next paragraph. He's saying when you encounter something from the opposite camp, ideologically, that is undermining tradition, calm down. Look at it carefully. And then respond. Now watch this. Look at the next verse. This is a great principle in the battle over ideas. If there's an opinion which contradicts the Torah, like biblical criticism, don't contradict it at the outset. Don't tear it down, Listore. Don't tear it down. Kim leave note that Armona Torah may may ma'ala, but first build the palace of Torah above it. I'll explain what this means in a second. This is a very famous passage here. Don't just contradict it. Build the palace of Torah on top of it. And by doing this, we ourselves become uplifted. And by this being uplifted, so uh, there. Uh, the uh, new ideas emerge. And only then can we fight against things that need to be fought against. Okay, let me explain what he's saying here. It's cryptic. But he's saying the following. And I see this so much. Right? There is an approach towards anything which sounds dangerous to Jewish tradition to say, this is heresy, and it doesn't deserve a response. It deserves outright condemnation and rejection. But Cook says it's a mistake. Think about what they're saying. Let's apply this to biblical criticism. If you take a look at every one of the examples of the Ibn Ezra or of Spinoza, Spinoza, in his essay, quotes, paraphrases the Ibn Ezra, but then goes on and says, now how about the next 20 examples, which indicates that the Torah was, that we have is not the Torah of Moshe. So the initial reaction is to say he's a heretic, he's horrible, he's going to go to hell, and uh, he also didn't pay his dues. In Joel, okay. So Rav Cook says, Calm down. Spinoza wasn't stupid. All of his observations, there's a logic to them. First, build the palace of Torah above. Meaning, you, as a Torah scholar, have to be able to respond intelligently to the points made by Spinoza. And if you do that, you'll see that in fact, you will cultivate yourself new insights into Torah, even coming from a traditionalist perspective. And once you've done that, you can then attack Spinoza, right? You can point out the errors of Spinoza, 
but only once you've been able to respond within our own traditionalist framework to build that palace of Torah. And you'll see that by responding to Spinoza, you're actually growing in your own knowledge of Torah. And that tension between tradition and Spinoza, he doesn't quote Spinoza here, but that's the notion. He, in other places, he does mention Spinoza explicitly. That responding to the tension is what breeds creativity in Torah. Without conflict, there is no creativity. Creativity is the grist, or I should say conflict is the grist of creativity. Build that palace of Torah on top and then respond. So this is a really uh, fascinating approach towards things which seem pernicious and destructive to Jewish tradition. Rob Cook suggests that one shouldn't be reactive and rejectionist. Calm down, think about the ideas, realize that the questions are good questions. Come up with your own answers, and now you've grown in Torah. And then you could respond to Spinoza's answers to his very good question. Okay, so far so good? Okay. Now, uh, because of the, uh, we don't have so much time here, so um, I think what I'll do is we'll read the next one inside uh, and then I'll just paraphrase the, the last one here. Okay, so let's go on now. A couple more sources where uh, Rav Cook seems to show a very nuanced and interesting approach uh, towards Wiesenschaft des Judentums. Have you ever heard of the Harry Fischel uh, Institute in, in Yerushalayim? I mean, it's essentially a kolel, uh, which trains Dayanim. Uh, it's a, a very high level place. Rav Cook founded that. A lot of people don't know that. And that institute was supposed to be an institute for the academic study of Talmud, believe it or not. Rav Cook, now see, when you're doing this to Talmud, it's a lot easier than, than the Torah. Rav Cook felt that when it comes to studying the text of Jewish tradition, we have to use all the tools at our disposal. This is from a, uh, a text that he wrote introducing, uh, from a speech he wrote, uh, the, this Fish, Harry Fischel Institute for the study of Talmud. Chochmat Yisrael, Omadah Yahadut, The wisdom of Israel, or the science of Judaism, Science Madaha Yadut is the Hebrew translation of Wiesenschaft des Judentums, right? The academic study of Judaism coming out of Germany, right? But Zachariah Frankel, those who are aware of this movement, right, ultimately became really conservative Judaism in the United States. Those, that approach towards tradition, he says, the scientific study of Judaism is only detached from tradition if the intent of those academics is secular. The scientific study of Judaism is problematic if the intent of those investigators is secular. But if you use the same tools, for the sake of Torah, the shape Shamayim, for the sake of heaven, I recall Ela Mitzvot Akluli Ba Ela Shemoshal Chachmat Yisrael Mada Yadun Ein Engufiy Torah. Then, if you use the same tools, but for the sake of heaven, that's called Gufiy Torah. That's Torah. Then listen to this: Bahalacha Ubahagada. Whether using modern academic tools to study Halacha or Agada, but Torah Shabichtav, but Torah Shvapeh. Whether using them to study the written law, the oral law, it's Gufe Torah. That's really Torah. So this is really an amazing approach coming from Rav Cook, where he's saying that the methodology of academic study is a powerful and legitimate tool to understand Jewish tradition, if done for the sake of heaven. Okay, now the last source here. 
this text, which is a rather long text here from a much longer text, is from a book that has been suppressed. Before Rav Cook made Aliyah, when he was still the Rav in Lithuania, he wrote a book called Le Nivuche Hazman to the confused of the generation of this time. This was modeled after the Rambam's More Nivuchim. It's the same word, Le Nivuche Hazman. More Nivuchim. Just like Rav Cook was addressing those who were confused by the contradiction between Aristotelian philosophy and Torah. So Rav Cook wrote a kind of guide for the perplexed of his time, dealing with all of these issues of how do you reconcile traditional Judaism with the theory of evolution, with archaeology, with biblical research, philology, etc. And this book was never published until a few years ago. And when it was published, there was a huge controversy that broke out in Ralph Cook circles. Thons Paria. Yeah, that's where I got this from. Many, maybe even most, of the kind of Merkaza Ralph Cook rabbis were opposed to its being published. They said the following. This text existed. He wrote it before he made Aliyah. Right? He made Aliyah in 1904. He died in 1935. He had plenty of time to publish it, and he never did. Why not? These rabbis, like Rav Aviner and others, Rav Aviner says he himself never learned it. He refuses to learn it. Because he sees, he says things in here that the claim is reflect in kind of immature stage in Rav Cook's own thinking. It's before he came to Israel and had the benefit of the, the Ruach HaKodesh that one gets from living in Ephrat, where every word that comes out of your mouth are pearls of wisdom. And therefore, he said things which are overly radical and not sufficiently thought out. And so therefore, Rav Cook himself suppressed it. This is the theory. And for us to publish it now would be doing a great injustice to the legacy of Rav Cook. Sorry, now, I've, been, I've, I've been Googling this as you speak, Rabbi, yeah. and I cannot see anything called Nebuchadnezzar Azman. I, I can find something called Nebuchadnezzar Hador. You know what? I, it's a printing error on my part. I made a mistake. It's Nebuchadnezzar Hador, I'm sorry. Nebuchadnezzar Hador, okay. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar Hador, right? And you can look, you'll see the, all the back and forth and screaming at each other among the uh, religious Zionist rabbis about whether this should have been published. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Now, what does Rob Cook say here? <clears throat> well, he says some pretty radical things. Okay. He says, among other things, that it doesn't really matter how the Torah came into being, whether it was given to Moshe or evolved into being subsequent to Moshe. That the authority of the Torah is a function of the fact that the Jewish people as a nation has accepted it as its constitution. I'm, I'm obviously putting this in my own words. Now, if you look at Rolf Cook's words carefully, he's not saying on a personal level that who cares whether it was given to Moshe or not. He says it was given to Moshe. But he's saying, even for those who have bought into modern biblical scholarship and uh, bought into the documentary hypothesis, it shouldn't matter because the Torah has become sanctified by our collective commitment historically to this document. No one in America would claim that the Constitution of the United States dropped down from heaven. <laughs> 
but it is binding and you know holy in the United States as a result of a collective commitment to it. And so Rav Cook claims that the authority of the Torah, even for people who have bought into non-traditional assumptions, is still binding as a result of our collective commitment over thousands of years to this text as we now have it, however it came into being. And therefore, all of the mitzvot of the Torah, if one feels an allegiance to the Jewish people, are binding by the mere fact that we identify with this collective of the Jewish nation. And even compares it to the notion of linguistic conventions. If I think that this thing I'm holding in my hand, which is a cell phone, if I think that this is actually a boo-boo, well, I have just disconnected myself myself from uh, anybody who speaks English because it's become national convention of all English speakers that this is called a cell phone not a boo-boo. Any Jew who has any notion of identification with the people must buy into the conventional assumptions of what that means. And one of that conventional assumptions is that our constitution, our soul as a nation is defined by this document, this constitutional document called the Torah. This is really an amazing notion. Again, bear in mind, he doesn't agree with the notion that the Torah evolved into being. He's just saying that even if you don't accept traditional assumptions, you should still feel part of uh, the Torah community and observe a Torah lifestyle. Okay, so uh, we'll stop with this idea. And what's fascinating, I'll just leave this for you to think about, and Rav Chaim can discuss this with you (laughs) another time. Look, we start out with Rav, uh, the quote from Rav Cook, in which he just, in the harshest language, uh, referred to uh, biblical criticism and the document hypothesis. And then you see these other writings of Rav Cook where he says, don't be reactive. There, the methodology has legitimacy to it. The questions are really good questions. And by exploring those questions, you will, in fact, increase your Torah understanding. You'll give different answers. And only after that clarification can you then attack a non traditionalist response. And furthermore, as we just saw now, that in fact, even if you buy into this non traditionalist approach, this is no reason to deviate from a Jewish traditional life because the authority of Torah is not a function of where it came from, but as a result of our collective commitment as a nation to this document. And with that, I turn it over to Rav Chaim. Thank you, Rabbi Zaf. Thank you.